We are live. Hello, everyone out there in Facebook land. Thank you so much for joining us for another Mortgage Leadership Outlook series. Uh, today, we got my good friend, Rob Crisman. Um, Rob, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, you hear me okay, Rob? I can hear you just fine, Andrew. Perfect, perfect. So, so Rob, listen, I'm, I'm, we're going to, you know, we are open uh, for any questions. If anyone has any questions, please, uh, you know, um, use the box to, to ask any questions that you might have. Um, Rob, I, I wanted to, uh, to, to talk to you about a couple of things. Now, you have been basically every day, um, you know, you follow the capital markets. Uh, I mean, if you want to know what's going on with capital markets, who's hiring, who's firing, um, who's opening up new offices, new products, um, uh, the, one of the best places to go to is you know, the, the, the Rob Crisman report. Um, I mean, as someone in the media business, um, like my entire organization reads it, reads it on a daily basis. Um, but one of the things that we love, but that you're great at covering is the capital markets. Um, so I, I wonder if you can actually start off kind of giving us a timeline of, you know, going back to like, you know, uh, end of, end of February where things are just looking, looking pretty good. Um, and just kind of break down like the timeline of events from February uh, to the, the, the quagmire that we're facing right now. Sure, Andrew, and <clears throat> thank you very much for the, for the kind words. Uh, usually I just make all that stuff up and throw it out every morning. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, in all seriousness, let's, let me, uh, let me, let me, let's take a step actually back a year uh, because if you go back to 2019, the beginning of 2019, all the experts were predicting uh, rates uh, were going to slide higher throughout the year. And you had companies that uh, were cutting their margins. They were fearing for their lives. They were looking at opening up new product lines, you know, whether they were reverse mortgage divisions or small business lending or you know, bond programs or jumbo or non-QM, whatever it might be. And then as 2019 went through, went by, the, uh, uh, you know, the economy really didn't pick up, although I should say the U.S. economy did well throughout early, to, or, uh, throughout two, 2019 and then the early 2020. The world economies, though, were, were stagnating and we had Brexit, uh, which nobody saw really coming up. And so... When rates went down toward the end of 2019 and early 2020, suddenly the industry was hit by this uh, torrent of refi applications. And then you started seeing news stories about this disease coming out of China. And suddenly everybody got very spooked. The, uh, the investors out there, the economists and so forth were watching this with, uh, with obviously quite a bit of interest. And I will say that at this point uh, in, in late, you know, where we are now, I would say that the world, the entire world is at a point that nobody foresaw uh, even as soon as a month ago, which is, you know, only four or five weeks ago. Uh, when news of this started to trickle out, people started to get a little bit nervous. I mean, it has had an immediate impact. And a lot of people will ask me, uh, will, you know, is this much different than 2008? Are we going to see the same things? And I will say that this is worse than 2008, unfortunately. Um, because in 2008, we really didn't have the political strife that we have now with the, uh, with the two parties so far apart and, a, and a, an election year coming at us, or we're in an election year, uh, seven more months until the election, uh, if the election is indeed held in November. Um, so we've got that going on. We've got a lot of finger pointing because of that. Uh, the second thing that we didn't have in 2008 is obviously the, the coronavirus and the epidemic, pandemic, whatever you'd like to call it. And then the third thing as a result of that is the financial crisis that we're seeing now that's worldwide. And Time Magazine had a great cover recently, uh, which mentions you know, what, what happens when the world shuts down. And we have really seen the world shut down to a degree that, that nobody could have foreseen. Uh, hourly workers around the world, anybody involved in hospitality, practically everybody involved in the restaurant business, uh, 
uh, hourly workers everywhere uh, are just, uh, you know, staying at home. Everybody's staying at home. You're probably at home now. Uh, I'm at home now. Uh, and so the, the world has indeed shut down. When you go out in your car, you have to go to the store at some point, right? Or run errands or whatever it is. It's, uh, you know, even busy city centers are like a ghost town. My son is in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, and he said, it's, uh, there, there's nobody, nobody on the streets, nobody uh, on the mall. And so it is really an amazing thing. And so that's one of the big differences between this and 2008 is that in 2008, we had kind of a uh, more of a gradual uh, dissolution of, of the financial system caused by something entirely different than people's lives. And so when you get a situation like we have now where people are genuinely concerned about their lives and the lives of their loved ones and, and is somebody walking down the street ahead of you or across the street, um, you know, are they infected? Are they going to infect you? What impact is that going to have? It really ratchets the fear up to a different degree than we saw in 2008. So heading into February and into, uh, you know, uh, we didn't see this coming. This disease, the impact that this disease would have on the entire world. And then as March has gone through, uh, we had a tremendous number of investors who uh, have, have changed their guidelines, their underwriting guidelines, their pricing guidelines, and so forth. And so the question is, well, you know, why? What's going on out there? The, the pandemic that's occurring right now, normally uh, you would think if the economy slows down, gradually or slows down in general, you would see lower rates. And that's what we've seen. Unfortunately, this has been so dramatic. And for, difference, uh, for different reasons than we've seen in the past, the, the volatility has increased dramatically to the point where now, given what we saw in 2008 through 2010, a lot of investors said, we are, we, you know, we are seeing credit risk out there. We are seeing an entire segment of the population that will no longer be working. And so it's just not, you know, employment creeping up or jobless claims creeping up. It is an entire world's economy where people are staying at home. And if you can't do your job and stay at home, then you're going to be filing for unemployment claims and it's going to be a problem for the world economy. So as that realism or as that, as that came to the forefront, as time went on, investors got nervous and are still nervous about the potential credit risk. And it's not, not only confined to borrowers, home loans. It's, con, it's, it, it's in the municipal bond area. It's in the corporate debt area. It's uh, sovereign debt from foreign countries. Can they pay their debt or will we have to print money in order to do so? So as this environment uh, increased in intensity, you had the US government take action with a $2 trillion uh, stimulus package. I think they, they call it uh, uh, phase three, and they're already talking about phase four in a month. Congress is out uh, on recess now for the foreseeable future. You have uh, the Federal Reserve stepping in, basically uh, announcing that they will have unlimited uh, treasury and mortgage agency mortgage-backed security buying. Uh, and so these steps that these institutions are taking right now uh, while helping to stabilize the market have further, I would say, made investors nervous to the extent or, 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 or saying, gee, if, if our federal government is doing this and the Federal Reserve is doing that, then things are really pretty dire. And oh, wow. the credit risk we have out there could be much more drastic than we think. And then they started looking at their possible range of investments. Well, the government has talked about treasury debt, has talked about agency mortgage-backed securities. It does not address, for example, non-QM securities. It doesn't address jumbo loans, some of the bond program loans that are out there. And so warehouse banks saw that and said, hmm, uh, this could be a problem. Not only do we have increased credit risk with borrowers, but we also have the government you know, backing agency mortgage-backed securities, but not these other securities. So let's scale back on our desire as a warehouse bank to lend against non-QM or jumbo products. When the investors saw that, they decreased their appetite. And when they decreased their appetite, 
Obviously, the companies that specialize in non-QM lending, such as Citadel or Deep Haven, Sprout, some of the others, had to rein in their ability to purchase loans uh, because there was there were no capital markets for those loans. Uh, and then when that started to happen, the jumbo investors followed suit with Redwood Trust changing things, with Wells Fargo changing things. Um, and so you have this ripple effect that's happened through the market. Uh, on top of that, we've had the forbearance news, which um, helped stabilize things from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and then from Ginnie Mae last Friday, which basically said, you know, we're going to we're going to help servicers and issuers. Uh, not only are we going to help borrowers who can't make their payments, but you know, we're going to we're going to ease over this this period of time where uh, payments are going to be tough and investors expect their principal and interest, and maybe the issuer can't deliver that, so we're going to dip into an emergency fund nationwide and do that. They do that from time to time, by the way, geographically based on a particular disaster, you know, if Houston floods or California has an earthquake, they step in, but this is nationwide. Nothing this big. Yeah. Like this. What's that? Nothing, nothing this big. And now and listen, right. people have been talking actually saying government lending is going to stop. Now, do you think actually this is enough of a measure to make sure we all know it's kind of it's not going to stop? But do you think this is enough of a measure with what Ginny May is doing uh, to pro provide the servicers uh, with a level of, of, of comfort? It, I think that it will. The, the big question now is what about the non-bank servicers? How much will the government or should the government step in? and help non-bank servicers uh, complete this task or, or give them the ability to continue to lend under FHA and VA guidelines. We saw a, a spate of uh, banks and non-bank lenders over the weekend toward the end of the week and, and into today, uh, ratcheting up their minimum FICO scores, for example, increasing their, their credit requirements, lowering, uh, <clears throat> certain things, raising certain things, tweaking their pricing to make it less attractive to deliver low FICO product to them, not eliminating products entirely, but changing things enough so that maybe some of the loans that you uh, have in your pipeline may not fit current guidelines. So I think there's a, a good degree of comfort, certainly more than we had, uh, you know, five days ago, seven days ago. Is it enough to, to really uh, stop a lot of the nervousness that's out there with say FHA and VA lending, I would say not quite, we're not quite there yet. It's, it's a new world and, and it's gonna take lenders and investors a little bit of time to, to figure out the details and where we go from here. Because the market is, is truly is, is unnerved right now. It's, it's rattled uh, to a degree that, that nobody could have seen coming, like I say, you know, a month or two ago, given the, the rate of advance of this virus and its impact on the economy. So do you, so what will it take for the, the street pricing to, to be able to come a little more in line with, with uh, where, where it should be uh, today figuring, I mean, um, as, I, as I listen, I'm, we should have lower rates, but because of these factors, because of actually margin calls, so all these other factors, lenders can't lower their, their rates. So like what would have to happen for the streets rates uh, to be more in sync where it should be? Well, that's a good question. You know, the, 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 the key phrase there, where they should be at this point, given everything that's happened, uh, both with the warehouse banks and with investors and with servicing values, uh, with uh, people's uh, health, uh, the uh, the question is where should rates be? And, and I haven't heard, frankly, a, a good a, a good answer about where they should be. The, uh, the the fact of the matter is the stimulus package has had a an unintended consequence, and that is to drive rates lower, drive mortgage-backed security prices higher, drive rates lower. Rate sheets should be lower. You're right. <clears throat> but right now, lenders are dealing with margin calls. They're dealing with early payment uh, or early payoff penalties. They're dealing with renegotiations. They are dealing with possibly hedging pipelines that don't exist because the hourly workers that they had approved, you know, a month ago or three weeks ago are now out of a job. And so they are dealing with 
an increased credit risk and they're dealing with loans that may not close that are in their pipeline that they've been hedging. They are dealing with capacity issues because there's so many loans coming through the system right now that uh, the industry can't handle them all. And so if you are a lender, uh, the quickest way to change your pipeline and change the volume coming in is to increase your margins. Yep. Right now, as opposed to a good chunk of 2019, nobody is having to really sharpen their pencil and, and improve their pricing by an eighth to get a loan. There are so many loans out there that companies have raised their margins. Um, and part of that, like I said, is in an effort, in an effort to uh, you know, increase their ability to be able to process the loans that they have in the pipeline. So it's a really a capacity issue, trying to close you know, trillions of dollars of loans in, the, in a matter of months. And to back, going back to your question about where should rates be, nobody knows really where rates should be. If the 10-year treasury is yielding 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, gee, shouldn't mortgage rates be in the twos? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of lenders don't want them in the twos because a lot of lenders just mm -hmm. gave loans that were in the threes or fours, you know, as short as two or three, four months ago. Do they want all those borrowers coming back and asking you to refinance? Do they want to deal with some of these borrowers who now are not going to be making their payments, who want to refinance, who want to uh, uh, redo their note, whatever it might be. So there's a lot of complications right now and lenders are perfectly happy to keep rates a little bit higher. Nobody's clamoring for lower rates right now. I think the loan officers that are out there are really focused on working their existing pipelines, making sure that those are real borrowers, real loans, not wanting to process or underwrite loans from borrowers that they know are not gonna fund. And so the, you have this <clears throat> really a, a lot of upheaval, not only with individual companies, but as, a, as an industry. So I think it's gonna take you know, some months before things actually settle back down to some kind of normalcy where, you know, the treasury market does this and mortgage rates do that. Uh, it's going to take a while and we have to get this capacity issue past us. And we've got to most importantly deal with this health crisis, which like I say, nobody saw coming. And yeah. uh, it's, that's really the more I read about it and hear about it. Uh, you know, it's very, very serious stuff, very serious stuff. And, and, you know, hate to sound like a commercial, but you know, without your health, what do you have? And uh, companies have done a magnificent job about moving their workforce to work from home, about caring for their employees, uh, reminding them to be careful, wash your hands, you know, don't go out in public, whatever it might be, um, because everyone's health is, is so, so important. And it doesn't matter what rates are, if you're sick in the hospital, um, you're not going to be laying there with a respirator saying, boy, I'm glad I closed the, the Miller loan. You know, it's like health first. So, yeah. so important. Yeah. And especially since the Miller loan is probably not a jumbo right now anyway. So, yeah, right. Right. exactly. <laughs> So we got a couple of questions that came from uh, the room, if you don't mind. Uh, Mike Bugiano, um, who's uh, thanks thanks you for being here. Um, so the mortgage uh, REITs have been hammered over the uh, past several weeks as a result of capital calls and lack of liquidity. How do these firms recover? That's going to take a longer time. The uh, uh, we saw the same thing happen in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. The, <clears throat> it's really a little bit of a, um, a complicated question because if you think about how REITs work and how collateralized mortgage, mor mortgage obligations work and so forth, you can get convoluted. Uh, I think they explained it pretty well in the big short with a uh, kind of a model of how things work. The REITs really have taken it on the chin. Uh, many of them are leveraged very highly. And when you are borrowing money, to buy mortgage-backed securities uh, and leveraging, leveraging yourself up and the servicing values are all over the map and uh, there, there is a huge rally in the mortgage-backed security market and so your, your positions uh, uh, see these wild fluctuations, investors get very nervous. Uh, that's gonna take longer to sort out, I think. I mean, we could be looking at the rest of the year into 2021 before those things sort themselves out. 
which is unfortunate because REITs are a good investor in mortgage-backed securities. Um, they are, uh, uh, they know their stuff and a lot of them are, are very well managed, some very uh, talented people in some of them. Uh, so, but it's gonna, that's gonna take quite a while, unfortunately, I think, to sort yeah. itself out. Yeah, so uh, next question comes from uh, Navi from my team. Um, uh, just curious what your thought about uh, companies uh, suspending lending activity. I mean, so we're seeing you know, lenders, uh, whether it's non-QM, uh, mostly a non-QM, um, suspending act activity. Um, you know, what are you seeing out there? Are you seeing actually, um, um, you know, conventional and conforming lenders uh, suspending uh, a lending activity? I have not yeah. now i don't see everything of course yeah. um but i am primarily hearing the non-qm folks and uh jumbo players have either uh you know rumors of stop stopping taking locks or adjusting their pricing accordingly what i have heard is lenders you know more mainstream lenders fannie freddie fha va and so forth who are changing their policies and procedures. For example, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they are raising minimum FICOs. They are um, changing underwriting guidelines that impact the Fannie Freddie product coming in. Uh, for example, uh, you could have a lender who continues to, to do Fannie Freddie FHA VA, but they uh, don't allow locks until the loan is approved, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, as a capital markets person, I had always hoped we'd see lending come back where you couldn't lock a loan until it was ready to go to docs, in which case the, the lender would have no capital markets risk whatsoever or, or minimize it at least. But of course, that's not easy to do in a competitive environment. But you have a lot of lenders out there now and wholesale investors uh, dealing with brokers who will not allow locks until the loan is actually approved. So they want to make sure they have a real loan. It makes all the sense in the world. So it's not so much lenders or investors just cutting off agency programs. Um, they, are, they are changing their pricing. They are changing their underwriting guidelines. They are changing their minimum FICOs. They are doing things that way uh, rather than cutting off something entirely. Yeah. Um, another, uh, another question. Um, this comes from uh, Melissa. Um, what support do you think lenders need right now? Like, what what are, what are, what do they need actually? That uh, the lenders that uh, maybe they they they're they're at the point where they need a lifeline. Um, I mean, what's what's the thing that most lenders need right now? Um, you know, I, I would I would say I'm going to give you an answer. Maybe that's a little bit unusual, uh, and it's not. It's not self-serving, uh, or at least I don't mean it to be self-serving. But right now, I would say people uh, need communication. They need the ability to communicate with one another. It used to be, you know, a month ago, you would go down the hall uh, to the, you know, the coffee room or lunch room and chat with your coworkers. Or you would lean over the cubicle and chat with your coworker. You would be able to have meet little short little meetings in the hallway because you'd meet up with somebody some processor and you had a question you could ask them in the hallway well that has vanished uh now you have everyone working from home pretty much you have some people going into the office but not not anywhere like it was a month ago uh and so you have a lot of people who are uh siloed i guess i'm not a big fan of that term but you have a lot of people who kind of feel alone and i think that what lenders need right now and almost every any company needs right now is the ability to keep those communication channels open, uh, whether that is some kind of group chat, some kind of running group chat, and I don't know all the software uh, that's available right now, but uh, the ability to communicate and throw a question out to your coworkers or the ability for the CEO or the owner of the company to have like a daily video chat. Maybe it's only three or four minutes, uh, three or four minute update that you can log in every day at nine in the morning and there's your CEO giving you a little pep talk or whether it's your show or whether it's my commentary in the morning. I think the, the ability to communicate is what companies need now most of all. Uh, sure, there's, uh, you could say, well, everybody needs, you know, five million bucks uh, additional warehouse capacity 
for you know the non-QM investors to come back. But I think in the day-to-day -day that we're seeing now, uh, it's really that, that it comes back to the personal touch and the ability for people to be informed and feel important and feel like they are part of an organization rather than just sitting in their living room with their cat in their lap, you know, underwriting files. So I would, I, that's my answer. That's great. So, so, I mean, um, do you think we'll see, well, I'm sure we'll see the return of non-QM and non-QM hasn't completely gone away. I know there's lenders out there. There's still actually non-QM lenders that are still um, writing loans. Um, what do you think, um, like it'll look like when, you know, when things does settle, will we see a non-QM market the way it was? Um, will we see actually, you know, uh, two months bank statements? Will we see, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of changes? Um, what's, what are your, what are your, what are your feelings knowing it's hard to predict actually what, what's going to happen with this world. But, you know, I, I think actually, you know, maybe, maybe there could have been, you know, the pendulum swung one way and now actually it'll swing the other way. What are your, what do you think is long-term for non-QM? So, so remember before all this happened that the CFPB was, and I imagine they still may, may be coming out with a proposal for QM versus non-QM guidelines in May. Yeah. And I think until we see those come out in May, I think the non-QM, uh, what has become non-QM uh, is gonna be uh, in, a, in a state of disarray. Yeah. One of the issues with non-QM, non-QM, is that there were varying degrees of what people and companies interpreted as a, a borrower's ability to repay. Can you gauge a borrower's ability to repay based on looking at one month's worth of bank statements? Yeah. Eh, you know, yeah. I'm not sure of that. Yeah. And so or the when, pile of cash that, that, that the person's family brings into the bank. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and so you had these different degrees of non-QM. And that's one of the problems that non-QM investors had was, okay, what's, what kind of loans are coming at us? And that uncertainty certainly didn't help the non-QM market. I think that if the CFPB is able to propose some guidelines that aren't necessarily based on a 43% debt to income ratio, maybe they're based on reserves, maybe they're based on payment history, whatever it is that the CFPB comes up with, and they've received a lot of input from the industry. Um, I think the non-QM industry at that point, after those regulations are put in place, I think that's when we will see the return of non-QM lending. Until then, you know, there's still too many questions that investors have about the guidelines and the policies and the procedures uh, and the appetite and the borrowers and so forth. So too much uncertainty. Fantastic. So um, today there was, uh, I believe, two or three job listings uh, in today's report. Um, you know, do you anticipate a lot more bodies being thrown at, at, at uh, you know, our, our volume problem? I mean, is it, uh, do you, have you been seeing a lot of hiring and do you anticipate to see a lot more of that? Yeah, I would, I, I do. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I think uh, some of the hiring uh, or some of the need for people is because personnel are being shifted over not only to process loans, but also deal with uh, the forbearance agreements or forbearance questions that companies have with regard to uh, loans that are in their servicing portfolio, because it takes a while to explain for forbearance. If somebody calls up or somebody, uh, you know, borrower who's sending their monthly payments to you and they call up and they say, well, what do I need to know about forbearance? How do I postpone my payments for three months? Can I, what do I need to do? Yada, yada, yada. It takes a while to deal with each one of those borrowers. And so I'm hearing already, companies shifting people that they can spare over into the servicing wing or yeah. servicing department to be able to answer those questions because they are very time consuming. And it is a primary uh, point uh, of contact between the servicer uh, and the borrower. And the CFPB likes to pay attention to make sure that those consumers are being taken care of. So you have to really beef up the customer service when it comes to that part of it. Um, but in terms of hiring, yeah, I know it's difficult to, to, to switch uh, oars in the middle of the rapids, but <laughs> the ability for companies to bring on trained, talented people in this kind of environment, uh, uh, I think is, is still present. And I think there's still a need for good people. Yep. 
there's no question about it. So, um, so let me ask you for, for you personally, um, you you normally work out of your home, right? You know, Andrew, that's a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> normally I do, but you know, I've sent the commentary out from some really fancy, neat resorts that I, people used to be able to go to before all this hit all the <laughs> way to, you know, a McDonald's on the court, on the, on the highway, because they've got, you know, good Wi-Fi. So uh, <laughs> most of the time it, it comes out from uh, my home. That's good. So, so your life, other than not being able to go to uh, fancy hotels or, um, you know, McDonald's to do your posts, um, pretty much is, is uh, the way it was before, right? Yeah, but, uh, you know, people, when they, when they travel a fair amount, they will gripe about, oh, I got to get on a plane, you know, because <laughs> I'm a, a fan, for example, of Southwest Airlines. Some people call it a cattle car, but I'm fine with Southwest yeah. Oh, I got to get on Southwest. Oh, I got to do this. I got to get an Uber. I got, you know, so forth and so on. But I'll tell you, when when it's taken away from you involuntarily, uh, it's really an uncomfortable feeling. And I think that there is a genuine lack, or I, I should say, there's a genuine feeling out there among people who are missing uh, conferences. Not only conferences that have already been canceled but conferences coming up that haven't even happened yet that will not happen because of what we're seeing now and because of the way hotels work and so forth, reservations. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that the autumn will be, uh, uh, and into you know November of 2020, we'll get these things past us and we'll be able to resume that kind of conference environment and some of the business travel that uh, we're giving up. Because oddly enough, at this point, I have no flights scheduled for the remainder of 2020. No hotel wow. reservations, none at this point. So we'll see how things go. So talking to mortgage bankers, uh, people that you've talked to, how are you finding their operations have been since going remote? You know, productivity has actually increased from what I'm hearing. And I was on uh, uh, some calls recently where senior management was saying that they were surprised by the productivity that they are seeing when they uh, were able to adequately move parts of their workfo workforce to be able to work from home and give them the tools that they need. Um, productivity actually increased, you know, people, especially people with long commutes, uh, they didn't have those anymore. So that's another, you know, more time that they can dedicate. They were uh, uh, dealing with their families. That tends to make people happier. But I think I think the initial the initial answer to your question is things things are actually pretty good out there in terms of the workforce that's that's now working from home. So that's that's a good thing. That's yeah, I'm, I'm I'm talking to a lot of people saying the same thing. They're working better actually than they have, have before. Uh, yeah, this is Brian Covey um, who's uh, with Loan Depot. Productivity is definitely up for us. I mean, so it's that's great. You know, yeah, I mean, and I'm hearing that across the board. And I'm hearing it actually from, from people that I know that were just so against actually any kind of remote sales or, or, or if you couldn't be in the office belly to belly, they did not want to, 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 to hire you. Um, so this this is going to change so much for how, how we work, um, you know, um, make us more productive um, and spend more time with our families. I mean, which is great. I mean, to, to have, a, you know, <laughs> trying to find actually, though, the, some of the positive things that, that are going to come from this. Um, what do you feel like they are like, so, so we got productivity. This is good. We got, uh, you know, um, Rob doesn't have to uh, chase around to find solid uh, Wi-Fi by going to McDonald's. What are the other po positive things actually that, that you think we're going to uh, walk away from this as a, as a better, stronger industry? Well, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of companies have uh, have really managed to improve their uh, contingency plans, you know, yeah. emergency plans, whatever it might be, the issues that they might have had with software or with hardware. Uh, I think have been worked on to a degree that if some natural disaster were to happen, you know, earthquake or hurricane or tornado, God forbid, uh, happens, I think that that the things that we've worked on as an industry last month or two have been or last month have, have really improved things. Um, I would say that the productivity is a nice offshoot. I would say that as an industry, it'll be interesting to see how, um, you know, this has all happened so quickly. Are we adhering to the cybersecurity concerns 
that many IT experts have about being able to work from home. I know that pe companies who have offshored uh, parts of their business to, to uh, foreign countries, now those foreign countries are, are insisting that their employees work from home, shelter in place, whatever you want to call it. That really raises some cybersecurity concerns because you would have a bank, uh, bank ABC, and let's say they have uh, uh, customer data, borrower data that's uh, being relayed to them and their workers are all in a safe room where they can't bring any personal belongings into that room. They can't bring their cell phones. They can't bring cameras and so forth because they're dealing with borrower information. And now those employees are being asked to work from home where in theory they could take screenshots, where they could take pictures with their cell phones. And so I think, I think that'll be the next wave when things settle down a little bit to really focus on to make sure cybersecurity concerns are being addressed. So unfortunately, this is, hasn't been a drill. It's been a real emergency that's happened here in the last month. I mean, it is a totally changed world than it was a month ago. And I think a lot of people are still trying to find their sea legs and deal with the changes. But, but certainly the offshoots are, you know, we're being able to work from home, uh, you know, yeah, seeing more of your family, as long as you love your family, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, some productivity and, you know, hopefully taking some time for yourself and, and uh, hopefully you're, everyone out there isn't working you know, 12 hour days because they've got nothing else to do except sit at home. Oops. <laughs> that's, that's my problem. <laughs> you know, I wake up early, you know, it's, it's right there. I got to come downstairs, like to the basement, start walk, walk working and, and I, uh, but I, I'm able to take break, breaks, have uh, some time actually with the family. But then, you know, I'm, I'm working because I know I don't have to drive home. So I'm working till whatever time. I mean, we just, uh, and I talk to a lot of people that are just doing the same thing. Like we're working more hours, but, but we're also, we're, we're sticking to our, 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 our workouts. We're spending more time with our family. We're going for more walks. Um, so, so I've, I think a lot, a lot of, a lot of ways, like, you know, we, where, um, we are actually becoming better people, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, this, this new norm, while it's gotten, it's become difficult to adjust to, I think there are a lot of people that are, that are going to walk away um, in, in a better position, at least personally um, and uh, business wise, uh, you know. It's just it's so much uncertainty. It's so difficult to, to understand what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, let alone what's going to happen in the uh, long, uh, long term. So, um, so uh, listen, we're going to wrap this up. I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, Rob, you taking the time to, to meet with us. I, I know uh, I, at least I don't have to worry about it. I'm competing with you going to catch another flight, uh, going on stage someplace. Yeah, as much I, as I, I know just, actually, yeah. you, you're, you're looking forward to. Yeah, I, I'm, I, after this, I'm going to clean out my cat's litter box. So that's <laughs> what I've got to look forward to. Okay, fantastic. All right, Rob, just stick around for a second. I'm going to I'm going to say goodbye to everyone on on Facebook. If you want to say your goodbyes, uh, goodbye, everybody. Chin up. You know, we're all in this together. And uh, like Andrew said, you know, take care of yourselves. Yep, and, and I'm assuming if you're watching this, you're you're probably already sub, uh, subscribed to uh, the uh, Rob Crisman's Daily Report. Um, otherwise, Google him. He's easy to find. And uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, I am Andrew Berman uh, from the Mortgage News Network and National Mortgage Professional Magazine. Thank you for watching. <laughs>